What's up, basketball coaches, players, and fans? Welcome back to the Pass First podcast, where we share our knowledge of the game. My name is Augie Johnston, and I'm here with my partner, Alex Engel, and we hope that you're able to take something away from today's episode that will help you in your basketball journey. Today, we got a really special one. We got a great guest on today. We have Chris Cobb from the University of Montana. He's the associate head coach there, and he's here to share all kinds of great information about post play, the stuff that they do, and the stuff that he's learned along the way in his journey. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into today's episode. All right, welcome in everybody. Thanks for checking out the episode today. We're gonna dive right into it. We got Coach Cobb on the line from the University of Montana. He's the associate head coach there. And just to start this off, first of all, thank you. And second of all, uh, give us a one to two minute background on yourself. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, guys. I really uh, appreciate it. And we're all trying to always find good podcasts and, and ways to get better and grow as, as coaches. Um, I grew up in, in Northern California. Uh, I grew up in the East Bay. I played at Bishop Out High School uh, and had a great experience. I thought as a, as a high school student, I knew I wanted to coach. I, I, I love the game so much. I played baseball and basketball. I knew I wanted to coach basketball just because I love the the competitive nature of it, the team aspect of, of what you had with basketball. Um, and I had such a great experience playing in high school with my coaches and, and the program that I played in. Um, I knew I wanted to get into coaching. And so uh, I went to Menlo College uh, where Alex went and, uh, and finished. And, and so I played there and, and in my time there, I kind of started to realize the power that you had at the college level. And so um, I immediately grabbed my attention. Actually, my, my senior year, I started an internship uh, doing film and video breakdown and different stuff just to kind of get a sense of what those guys did on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You don't get to see what kind of college coaches. I always get the question, like, what do you do every day? Like, what do you do in the summers? Like, do you, do you have another job or do you, like, do you do anything? And so uh, I got to see firsthand what my college coaches were doing all day long from a recruiting aspect, uh, film breakdown, film exchange, camps, uh, all the different aspects of it. And so um, – I was initially going to coach at Menlo, and then the, the, the guy that I played for, Brandon Laird, uh, took a job at UC Davis. And so uh, I got connected with, with Bill Tressler over at San Francisco State, spent one year there, uh, and then uh, spent four years at Chico State with Greg Klink. I uh, had a great experience there in the CC2A and really kind of knew that in my time at Chico, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I learned I wanted to be a college basketball coach and, and then stay at that level uh, and loved the Division II level and got lucky enough to to jump on here with Travis DeCure at Montana uh, and now is starting my seventh season, which is crazy to, to think. Uh, and so a lot of different turns and we've had a lot of different success and uh, college coaching kind of can throw you in a lot of different uh, directions but I've been lucky to be around great people and, and good mentors and coach good players and um, it, it's been awesome so I'm now I think I'm starting my 12th season now coaching which is crazy to think about. Nice and you know before before the interview we you know did a little research and stuff and yeah you got you've been on a winning streak so any programs out there that need a coach that's on a winning streak here he is. <laughs> yeah well I hope uh, we, we, we won yesterday against Yellowstone Christian College by 60. Up until then uh, we're 0 4 this year so it, it's been <laughs> COVID's kind of thrown us for a loop a little bit. It hasn't, hasn't been a, a good year so far but we'll we'll get it right. But no I, I think more importantly it's been I've been around really really good people you know and I think that's uh, the one thing that has led to success and you know, the good men I've worked for have been a bar, you know, been uh, instrumental in recruiting really good kids. And so when we bring them into the program, it's pretty easy to, I think, have success that way. Yeah. And, and the, the winning streak I was referring to, just so everyone doesn't think I'm totally dead wrong on that, was the success you guys had at Chico, right? Yeah. And then the success yeah. you had, have been having at Montana. So cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so you've been kind of moving up in the ranks a little bit. And so I guess, what has your experience been like moving up in the ranks? Like how, what, what are some things that you've done that have allowed you? Is it, is it just the network or what were some advice you could give, I guess, for some other young coaches out there? Yeah, I think uh, it's hard, right? Like coaching high school, AAU, college um, is a grind. And I think it's one of the professions that in some ways forces you to constantly 
look at your peers and think about like, what's the next thing, right? I think everybody always thinks about well, what's the next job. And I, I caught myself a lot, like when I was at the division two level, even at San Francisco state and, and at Chico, um, like I want to be a division one assistant coach. Like that was kind of my goal. Like, okay, that's the jump I want to make. Um, and so what's hard is I think you tend to not be in the present. Right. And like, I think that you start thinking, okay, well, how do I get to that? And, for me, I think what's been really good is like, I've been able to like really dive in and invest in the programs that I've been at. Um, and I think you do have to get some luck. You have to get a little lucky. You have to have some connections. You have to have relationships. And that is critical and paramount to, to being able to kind of move on and, um, and do things and winning, right? Like, you know, you mentioned like we had really good success when I was at Chico. Uh, we've had really good su success since I've been at Montana, which has led to doors opening. Um, but I do think that being present, like I would say, you know, one of the things I, when I got asked in an interview this past summer, like, what, what do you do well? Like, what has been part of your success or what have you done well? And I said, well, to me, I think I've, I, I've really invested in the programs I've been at. I haven't thought about the other jobs, especially since I've been at Montana. I think it, when you're at the lower levels, you tend to think, well, how do I have a relationship uh, to the next thing, right? Because at it, the lower levels, you're not making enough money, right? You know this, like working at the one year at Monterey Bay, like you're grinding. Like I was making my first year at Chico, I made like $400 a month. You know, I'd call my grandparents and say, can I get a hundred dollars to, to make rent or eat that, that next week. And so for me, uh, it's be present. Right. But then I also think you have to, you have to be authentic too. I think with your relationships, like Travis and I had had a relationship for a few years. Uh, so it wasn't one of those deals where I was hitting them and trying to get a job. And uh, I had done that at different places in my time at Chico. Um, and I think the thing that led me to having a good relationship with Travis hired me as an assistant coach, right? A lot of guys going from division two assistant jobs or taking video and ops jobs. Um, he hired me and, and believed in me enough in my experience to, uh, to hire me as an assistant coach. And I do think that my experience at the lower level was so powerful. Uh, and I think prepared me to get here. When I got hired at Montana, uh, I was the third assistant. Uh, I was with John Ometzger Jones, who's now at UC Davis, who has a tremendous resume and had a lot of experience. Ken Bone, who was coming from being a head coach in the Pac-12 to being a, a, you know, a big sky assistant coach. And then Travis, who was an associate head coach at, at Cal. Um, so like the guys that I was around was, were pretty experienced and had a lot of experience at the division one level. And I never felt like I wasn't prepared to do the job every day. Um, and I think a lot of that goes to Kevin Nosick and Brandon Laird and Bill Tressler and Greg Klink and Gus Arginal, who I was around every day um, as a young, as a player and as a young coach. Uh, but I did the job every day, right? Like Travis couldn't look at me and say, Hey, uh, run study hall, run academics, do a scout, go recruit players. Like I had done all of it. Right. Whereas I think some of the guys you get caught in video jobs or ops jobs, or even at this level, at the, the, the division one level where you're like, okay, you're just going to recruit or you're just going to do academics. Uh, you, you get exposed at division two, right. If you can't do everything. Um, and so for me, that's kind of been my journey. And I think that's why I've been able to have success is authentic relationships. And I think really pouring into the programs that I've been a part of. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I think that's definitely a, a difference between high school. We're both varsity high school coaches, um, yep. and and the collegiate level is man. That that was a lot of responsibilities you write. I mean, I, we don't even cover all that here. You know, we can't with with the well, but you, you, we have, but you do, and it, it, you do it in a different way, right? Like it, sure. it's you. It we have ridiculous resources here, so we better do it at a really high level, you know. Um, and so I think that's the that's the thing is. Uh, I think, and that's the trick of this level. And some of the things I hate about it, to be honest with you, is like, there are so many different people. There's an academic, uh, you have an academic coordinator, right? The, the advisor that handles our guys. And mm -hmm. um, in some ways there's power in like being able to do that with the guys. Like I remember my, my deal at Chico now, now I have a family, so it's different. I don't have as much time. Like, you know, I have to balance my time in, in different things, but having academic conversations with the guys is powerful because you connect with them on a different level. It's not, Hey, I'm just connecting you on the basketball court. Um, I have to be more intentional now than I've ever been with the relationships I have with our guys going out to eat with them, um, finding ways to connect with them off the court because I don't get to touch them as much 
<laughs> they'd say touch yeah. my I don't get to be around them as much as possible as I did when I was at Chico I'd spend individual workouts and uh, study hall and practice and so I'd be around them nonstop. and you know to me I, I'd go back to it like wherever we're doing it right whatever level you're doing it at you got to love the guys uh, you got to nurture relationships um, and, and it's really no different in any, in any aspect, but there are a lot of things to cover. The travel that we deal with is, is nuts. You have to have people that can handle travel and handle the academics while we're on the road and different things. So it's, it, it gets a little bit hectic at, at times. Yeah. And I mean, Alex was at a, a junior college for a while coaching there. So he probably got a little bit more taste of that than myself, but I mean, it was just been in one year, but all right, cool. Let's go ahead and dive a little bit into the X's and O's now and, and the style of play and stuff like that. So let's talk a little bit about offense first and um, just give us a little bit of rundown of, of your guys' style of play and, and not exactly X's and O sets or anything at this point, but just, yeah, what's your style of play offensively? Yeah, so one of the real cool things that I, I mentioned, right, like I – played for guys at Menlo that were connected to the men that I worked for at San Francisco State and Chico. So it's all very similar, right? Bas mm -hmm. Like in terms of philosophy, basketball wise, uh, when I got here, Travis played uh, at Montana um, where Mike Montgomery started his career and that coaching tree. And so everything that we've really done here in, especially offensively is based around Mike Montgomery and kind of what he did at Stanford Cal, even with the Golden State Warriors. And so, um, I was telling Alex, it, it's somewhat high low um, in in terms of the nuts and bolts. Some guys call it like the power package. Um, you know, I think we're more old school basketball, right? You start watching the European game, you watch the NBA, you watch some of the trends even in high school and college basketball. Um, it's spread, it's ball screen, it's uh, dribble drive, all those things. And we're really kind of the polar opposite of that. Uh, and what I think is really neat is when you go look at like the analytics and you go on some of the, the sites, we're constantly uh, at the top of a lot of these sites and numbers of being the most efficient. And so it's kind of cool because some of the things that worked in the seventies and eighties are still working today in today's basketball, right? Just kind of what you do and what you know. Um, but we really play high low. And one of the things that, that coach always emphasizes is, uh, it, we kind of break it down into thirds. And so uh, like when we recruit guards, we always talk this way, but, 33% of our offense should come in transition. And so we're pushing in the break and we have a way that we run our break with a first post and a trail post. And that kind of feeds into everything that we do on offense. Um, we run our wings wide. So we have good spacing. Um, and really, if you're, you know, if you're playing defense at the level that you want holding people under 40%, right. That's kind of our target goal. Every game, 33% uh, of the offense should be the point guards, right. He should be able to dictate what we do, whether it's, uh, getting in the paint and hitting our turn actions and, and running different things in, in transition. But the nuts and bolts of what we do is, is really high low with our bigs. And so um, we play with a four and a five. Uh, a four typically is more stretched away from the rim, uh, but the four or five are pretty much interchangeable. Uh, and the way that I think we've always done it, and I think it's, it's kind of cool because I'll go back and catch myself watching Mike Montgomery film from when he's at Stanford and Cal. And even with the Warriors, it's crazy. He's running it in the NBA. Um, but really everything that we do um, – is kind of a theme to have high-low with the bigs and then everyone's an option. Um, and so, uh, you know, that we'll have different things that we do out of that to get different looks. Um, and our phrase really is the defense is always wrong. And so with our high-low looks, we're getting, we're looking to get two to three turns of possession, which is kind of why our possessions are a little bit longer. Um, we start a lot of times in a traditional stack, right? Like an old school traditional stack, which is um, probably so mind-boggling to some people that watch basketball today but we'll start with you know two guys uh, on each block and pop out and, and run it from there um, and then as we transition that's like the middle of nuts and bolts and then the last 33 percent right is late clock and what do we do with late clock and so um, I think we we've altered year to year with what we do and how we do it um, based off who our best players are and where we can get our, our highest efficiency you know high, most efficient shots um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been really good for us. We've been really, really efficient. Uh, I think the one thing that I've learned within this system is it's powerful to know where you're getting your shots and who's getting your shots. Uh, I think it allows guys an individual development. Like they, we use Alan Crabb a lot from their time at Cal and now he's playing, he's kind of played all over the NBA. Um, but like this system put Alan Crabb, uh, you know, and, and Travis always says this, but they played with Alan Crabb 
who was first team all conference, one of the best players in the Pac-12 at Cal, uh, you know, Curtis Borchard, Mark Madsen, the Collins twins played with this at Stanford. Uh, they've had incredible point guards, Jerome Randall, Jorge Gutierrez at, at Cal. So like, it's all, uh, they've had all conference players at every position doing the same thing essentially. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of different screening angles in terms of the high low that we do. We utilize go screens and baseline screens and different things, but, um, the main meat and potatoes is using the high low bigs to kind of create an advantage for us in the half court. Okay, cool. Yeah. That made a lot of sense. Alex, did you have something? Well, I was going to say when you said the the stack, uh, the, the set stack stuff, that's we actually run that at Cuesta um, for yeah. years. And, and now our, our head coach at Cuesta was a um, a three year starter at Oregon, you know, back in the yeah. in the you know seventies. And uh, and we, it's funny because I have never heard, I've literally never heard a coach run set stack until today. Like that, that you're the first coach I've ever heard say like, yeah, we run a set, you know, in the half court. Now we we would run run secondaries as well, but anytime we got in the half court, and I still do that with my high school kids where if we're in the half court, you know, a lot of my plays come out of a set stack. Cause to me, I like getting organized out of that. Um, For sure. And it just, it works real well. So that's just, I just wanted to add that in there. I don't think I've ever heard someone say that before until today. So. It's funny. Cause, and that's one of the things that we say, right. Is if you defend and you get stops, you can push like it's on you guys. Now, if we get scored on, yeah, it's on it. And now <laughs> that's what, that's us. Now we're, now we're calling, we're dictating what we want to do. Um, and there's power in that. Like, I think, we come down and we get good shots. We don't play super slow. Um, you know, there's good pace to what we do. We're big with screening and, um, and, and whatnot. But uh, I think one, one of the things that we struggle with, and I don't know, Alex, if you, if you can feel this way, but then I know that Travis has always talked about, they struggle with this at Cal. And I think Montgomery always mentioned this is when teams crawl up inside of you, what do you do? Right. Cause when you are, you know, a, a team that comes down and gets into a set and, enters the ball a certain way sometimes it's hard right we just played Georgia last week and it was it was impossible sometimes for us to enter offense and so uh, you got to have continuity with what you're doing it's always good when you have juniors and seniors because they have an understanding of how you're going to get into it some of the counters right when you do get when you do get pressed and uh, or pressured um, but it's it's been really good for us and it's been a way that we get really really high percentage shots around the basket um, and we're not just a and I think one thing we, we get good bigs like it allows us to say to a, a young man that we're recruiting hey we're not just going to have you set a ball screen roll to the rim and let all these little guards shoot shots and you go either get a roll or go get it off the glass right like you're going to get high percentage shots uh, which is why we've always had you know bigs that are shooting 60 plus percent uh every year for the most part nice uh one one question that pops into my mind um especially when running this kind of offense because actually we run that offense too we run like the bill self high low cross you know yeah. cross, cross screens i don't know if it's similar um similar yeah. concepts similar okay. concepts yeah. yeah like just i mean definitely similar concepts we played kansas a couple years ago uh and did the scout and it's similar concepts similar type deal for sure Nice. So one challenge that I always, always have with that offense is it's hard for us to kind of flow into it. So we're talking about you, do you have secondaries or do you guys normally just play free? And then if you have to like, you know, set it up, then that's what you run. Yeah, we, we've done our, our meat and potatoes of like, when I say high, low, uh, is we run a version of like a flex to start it. Um, but it's a different angle of it. So we call it a 20 cut. Uh, and so we call it 20. That's our offense, but it's a 20 cut. And so rather than a traditional flex, right, when you get a catch up at the top and then the flex screen is almost like, a, you know, a 90 degree cut, right? Like mm -hmm. short corner through the block. Ours has stepped up a little bit. And so uh, it makes a little bit different screening. Angle. It's a little bit harder to guard. One thing we've done is we've almost flowed into it. So like on our turn action, right, whether it, whoever runs first post, the four of the five runs first post. They don't get it. They duck in. They're looking for the ball from the point guard off the, the off of the, the push. If we turn it through the other big, they're looking high low initially, and then we'll actually start it with that twenty cut. Um, wow. And so that's one way that we float into it. We've also we've got different looks out of the high low that we'll do. Like we'll stagger away. We'll turn it all the way through, stagger away, and then get into some different action. Um, it's not easy. I think, I think that's one of always the challenges, right? Uh, Gonzaga does it really well. I think like they're one of the teams that really flows into high, low action really well. Um, I think that I've watched like they they have some similar concepts to what we've done. Um, like you mentioned, Bill Self, they do a really good job 
of running high low like out of a ball screen motion um and then some of the stagger action early in like their uh their early offense or out whatever you want to call it transition offense uh, but so it is it's, it's tricky it's hard to get into a set and flow into it right like that's not the easiest thing in the world but um we're always trying to find different ways so that's one of the ways that we've done it so do you incorporate any ball screens at all in, into it Oh yeah. 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 There's different calls, different sets. You know, like I, I say like 20, right? Like that's, that's what we call it. 20, like base, base offense is 20. Um, out of that one set, we probably have 12 different counters. Um, when we're really, really good, we have good continuity. We have juniors and seniors that have done it. They can do it almost on their own. They're reading the defense, right? So it's like, okay, now when we're on the sideline and we say, okay, well, Jamar, has got two touches or his guy can't get his guy keeps getting screened. Well, let's run 20 back cross, whatever it is. Right. Like we'll have, which is a cross screen action. Right. And so um, we'll do different things where we, you know, we turn it through a big, we turn it back and we'll have actions that we, we call it like turn get. Right. So you turn it and go get, go get with the ball screen. Um, so like out of that one base offense, we probably have 12, 13 different things that we'll do that get ball screens that get, uh, they get shots, right? Like I tell you, like Alan Crabb uh, ran this offense at Cal. Well, they just, they had bigs. They weren't really talented bigs. They were screening bigs. So they used those bigs to run the offense and then run Alan Crabb off of screens, right? They had Alan Crabb, they had, uh, they had uh, I forgot now, it's Justin Cobbs uh, and they had Jorge Gutierrez. Well, they ran those guys off screens and they just played within the same offense with ball screens and, and, and down screens and go screens and different things. So, um, I think that's the beauty of it is that you can, we do it a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different options out of it. I was going to ask, do you, are most of your, like when you guys get into stuff, like let's say sets or different things, are they based off of that same 20, you know, I know you said you have a lot of different options. So is it most of your sets are based out of that or do you have stuff that's like, okay, this is way different. You know, this is completely a different set. Maybe it's out of a one, four or a low set or whatever. Um, you know, that looks completely different than your normal offense as well. Yeah, we will, uh, we'll do some high post stuff, um, like, uh, almost like an elbows action or horns action, um, with our wings lower than the, than the bigs at the high post. Um, everything will kind of feed into the high low look though. That's kind of similar. So, um, and there's, like I said, in that P look in, in our high, high post look, whatever type of offense you want to call it. So people have different names for it. Um, there's probably another eight to nine options out of that. So like we have like a few base offenses that we will counter and we'll change and tweak um, based off who our best players are that year. You know, last year we didn't really have, we had one big that could score on the block, um, but nobody else really. This year we've got three or four guys that we feel like could score on the block. So we're very much like we're running these base offenses to get the ball inside and play inside out. Um, so it, it kind of varies year to year based off of, the talent and, and the strengths of our team. Uh, but, and there's a few different looks of how we get into things and, and whatnot. Okay. Cool. All right. So it's good that we have you on because you're actually the first person that we've had on that we're able, able to talk a little bit about post play, because as you know, that's very, you know, hard to find these days. Yeah. So uh, how do you teach, how do you teach your players to work in the post? Is there any certain techniques that you, uh, and I know, you know, posting, a high low look is a lot different than, you know, getting a catch on the block. So talk us through just getting a catch on the block. Is there any kind of technique you guys teach post players? A ton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it, that, that part has been really good for me because Travis is a point guard. I'm a point guard. Uh, Jay Flores, who's on our staff is a point guard. Uh, Travis, we always joke is almost like the point guard, like was meant to be a big man because he <laughs> loved, and he, he teaches it really well. Um, because the offense really flows through the post. We're big on ducks, like ducking and sealing. Um, within our offense, like if we asked our post to catch the ball on the block and score uh, at a 50 plus percentage clip uh, by just making post moves, it'd be pretty hard, right? Like you gotta be mm -hmm. really, really talented. Our goal is to get two to three layups. We have Michael Stedman, who's from the Bay Area. He's, he's, he played at, uh, at, at James Logan High School. He played at San Francisco City College. He's a transfer from San Jose State. Um, right now, he's six, our 6'10 big man. And we went through and looked at all of the different um, clips. He's only going to play with us for one year. So he was a red shirt last year for us. 
He's playing this year, only have one year with us, hopefully two because of COVID, they get the year back. So we'll, maybe Mike will come back. Um, but we're on Mike right now about saying, you don't need to catch the ball in the block. Like, you should be catching the ball with two feet in the paint. Like, mm. that is the goal. And if you're a really good screener, right, your guy has to help, and then you duck and seal, and you catch the ball with at least one foot in the paint, maybe two, um, and then you're shooting a layup. Like, you're not even making a post move, right? Like, mm. you should be shooting four to five shots a game without even having to make a post move um, based off how we run, of our, we run our offense. Some people do it right with the ball screens. Like, they're going to say, hey, you're going to roll and, and all that. But you can't dictate it. We dictate shots for our bigs. Like, there's times where we know you're going to get a shot right now if you do your job. If you set a screen on that 20 cut and you duck and you seal, you're going to get a shot. Now, if you don't, then we're going to cross screen for you. And if you don't get a shot on that, if you don't get a touch on that, the ball is going to turn on a stagger. And Travis's big phrase is the defense is always wrong right? And so if you're three-quarter front or you're fronting me on one side and that ball turns and you effectively, we call it like leg whipping and sealing, so you leg whip and turn and hold him off, you should be able to get a shot on the other side, right? Now it's somewhat predicated on the guards being able to, to catch the ball turn at the right time uh, and, the, and the guards being able to feed, but that is what we're teaching, right? We're teaching how to get layups, right? Like we, we can get layups on teams and we've done that, uh, rather than having to take catch one, two dribble, you know, lift fake, whatever it is, get to the middle and, and shoot a, sh a shot over somebody else. Um, we want layups. So uh, we're, we're big on teaching ducking, sealing as the ball turns, leg whipping, um, letting maybe the, you know, in terms of post play, like, and we're teaching Mike, I'm not going through right now what we're talking to Mike about every day, but you know, the defense may get you on the first side. That's okay. Like we want him sometimes to just be able to get you. Like don't let it, don't let it in. Okay. Now on the second side, now we got him. Right now he's mm -hmm. dead to rights. So go ahead, and turn that thing, seal him, duck him, and, and, and go get your bucket. So um, I think that's one of the things that we talk about and teach, you know, a lot. And we've had really, really good bigs. We've had two of, in the mid major level, two of the best bigs um, in the country in my six years here because they really understood how to do that, how to seal, how to use their size, uh, how to use their feet to create advantages for them. Nice. And you, you mentioned there something about, um, you know, does the guard have the ability to feed the post? So is that something that you need to practice? Because in my opinion, the post feed is probably one of the hardest passes to make. You, know, you see so many times it gets deflected and all that. But then you think about, well, how do we practice it? It's, it's kind of a, a, a thing that you don't see very often being practiced. So is there a way to improve on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we're getting humbled right now as a staff because I talk about continuity. Uh, we've had an older team for a while. We had, we had a run of guys where when we were winning our conference and going to the NCAA tournament, we had three or four-year guys in the program. Um, and we're learning right now that it's not, it's not – we don't just get guys that understand how to do that. So we spend – about 10 minutes to start of every practice, we call it pass through. Um, and we, we do different things every day. It might be just literally two guys starting across from each other um, and just working on different things, wraparound passes, bounce passes, chest passes, ball fakes, different things. Um, we may do the old school funky in the middle, right, where you have a guy closing out, working on closeouts and tracing the ball, getting it around them. If you get a touch, you get out. Uh, the one thing I think we found a lot that's been really good is uh, we've moved our pass through to the wing. Um, and because, we're, like I said, we're, we're really uh, emphasizing throwing the ball into these three, four guys that we'll go, we'll literally start uh, on two ends of the court. We'll put guys on each wing, right? And so we'll have a line on all four wings on the court with coaches on the block. And so we'll just change up all the different entries. So it may be one dribble bounce pass baseline. It may be one dribble baseline, rip back through, enter it to the middle. Um, and so we've changed, we'll go about 10 minutes, two minutes each, each thing. Um, where we're talking about different post entries. What is the big doing? You know, is he, does he have a, a target hand up on the top? Does he have a target hand down on the bottom? Um, and that's been big for us. That's been really big for us in terms of younger guys understanding the footwork, right? Because not necessarily being willing to make the pass. It's like having the footwork, the timing to be, on, to be in sync with a post player to be able to enter that thing. So um, we spend a lot of time doing it and teaching the footwork it's, that's necessary to get it in there. Mm -hmm. I think that's like a really important, and I know Augie, you said it doesn't get taught very often, but I think it's a really important skill that um, 
people just don't even think about. I mean, I think passing in general, I think we even did an episode on this dog about how passing in general is like an underrated skill that people just don't think about to work on. They think that, you know, just playing is going to make me a better passer, but you actually have to be able to, you know, not only pass with both hands, but I think when you get reps like that all the time, what I've found is a lot of players, it's not that they're not necessarily willing to, but they don't have like the confidence to throw the ball in because they're afraid that if they enter the ball in the post and it's a turnover and then it's in the back of their head and they're like, Oh crap, I don't want to do that again. You know? So they lose confidence. So I think that's really good that you guys do that. Um, and probably something I need to incorporate more into my own practices, you know, to make, make my girls work on it. One of the things that I think we're going through too with a young team and a new team is like the timing of offense too. Right. So like, you know, I talk about ducking and sealing. Well, the timing of that has to be right. The ball has to turn at the right time. Um, as the ball does turn, that we always have, mo you know, action going on on the weak side, right, to occupy the defense on the weak side. And so that's when you got to enter the ball, right? So typically we're running a shooter off the backside as we're ducking and looking for the post entry. Well, you know, we always talk to the, the, end, the guy that's entering the ball about saying, okay, well, if there is someone on the backside, right, that you can't enter it in, well, who's open then, right? That's that shooter coming off on the backside. So mm -hmm. that's where I think our offense is good. And I said there's multiple options and counters to what we do. Um, but it's a lot of timing, too. We spend a lot of time 5-on-0 and 4-on-0. Uh, we do a lot of 4-on-0, too, to break down specific things within our offense, of screening, screening angles, and the, the timing at, at which all this stuff should occur. Nice. And just kind of a off the cuff question right here in talking about post play and stuff. Uh, and a lot of people say it, but I, I, I've actually never really seen it too much when people say we love to post our guards. We love to post our point guards. We love to, And a lot of people say that, but I, I really don't see it. Do, is there any in any of your coaching experience from I know when you first started, was there any of a team that you coached on or anything where you guys did post guards or maybe you do now? Uh, we had Saeed Prigiot last year, who, who's actually from the Bay Area, El Cerrito kid, um, was, was our best player, who was a big guard, 6'5", a um, little slower, um, not, not like your typical guard, right, like, like you think of. Um, and so we, we, we posted him when he, had, when he had opportunities, but I wouldn't even say he was a guard. He was kind of like a point forward. He's like, you know, he, he could do multiple things. Um, we've never really done that. We've never really posted guards because guards are never really used to doing it, right? Right. Um, I think uh, we've had it happen to us once, you know, like where um, Northern Colorado, Jeff Linder, who's now the head coach of Wyoming, uh, would really take advantage of that. So he'd be able to see, okay, I know that uh, – my guard has an opportunity and, and, and an opportunity to post and, and would do a little bit of that. I think as a coach though, like coaching defense, you're like, okay, like if, if that's what they're going to resort to, that's where they're going to go to. We'll probably be okay. Right. Like I've never, I haven't seen a guard that makes like a really good post move or a high percentage shot, just posting on the block or backing you down a ton. So um, we've never really gotten hurt with that. We've never done that. And I think part of it is probably because, uh, Travis is more of the old school mentality. He's like, come on, you should be shooting that shot. That's for the, that's for the big <laughs> dudes. Right. So, uh, we've never really done it. We've done it occasionally with Saeed, but I don't, I don't know if I consider him a guard. I don't even know what I would call him. Right. Like he, he's playing guard over in Europe right now, but, um, it's cause he's six five, but uh, he really wasn't your prototypical guard. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I can think of a couple guards in my day that, uh, were big guards that could have played in the post and stuff like that. And they, they just get you on your hip. You know, that's how those guards are. They're not quick, but somehow they're just able to get their defenders on their hip and then it's over for you. You got good center of balance, right? Good center of gravity. So they're, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're pretty good down there. Saeed, Saeed was elite at getting people lifted and off balance. And so that's why he, I mean, he was literally, he was a six, five forward guard. I don't know what you'd call him. Right. Um, but he literally would get layups. Like I, I've never seen anything. Jay, uh, Jay Flores on our staff would sit there and we'd be watching him play. We'd throw him the ball down there and get a layup, uncontested layup. Like, how does that happen? Like you gotta be so talented and crafty to just get an uncontested layup at this level. Uh, he did it, un, you know, he had to draw a double team otherwise. So um, yeah, it's okay. interesting. Cool. So let's keep with the theme here. Talk a little bit more about um, post play, but a little bit more about player development. So what are some things that you guys do? Maybe there's like some daily vitamins you give your guys or something like that. Like vitamins as in like actual, like uh, you're saying, I've actually heard the phrase vitamins recently, like as in like things you do on the court or actually like daily vitamins that we take. Yeah, on the court. Sorry. On okay. The court. That, no, no, no. That's a good step. I'm, I just want to make sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's different things. There's a post progression that we do every single day. Um, 
you know, in terms of hook shots and counters that we do, I think one of the things that uh, we're really good with is kind of letting the guys be creative for what works for them. Like we've got a lot of different guys in a lot of different phases of their careers. Michael Stedman's pretty advanced, right? So, um, you know, for him, his counters are different than our freshmen and, and sophomore bigs. Um, but there's definitely a post progression that we work through every day in terms of how do we try to get a shot? Uh, what do we do to get a shot? off of no dribbles what do we do with one dribble what do we do with two dribbles what's our counter move um every single day in the post um and and really and also i think along with that with our back to the basket moves is face up game right like if we do get a catch off the block and you're a guy that can do that what do we do in terms of sweet moves and uh playing off of one or two bounces so um there's things that we're doing every single day with our guys like we are with guards and and whatnot um, but i think the key for us is like we give them somewhat the freedom to understand who they are what your strengths are what's good for you and what's not good for you you know and and so um we got bigs that are 6'6", six, six, that are just a little bit thicker, that can move people. And we got Michael Stedman, who's 6'10", that, you know, kind of needs to be able to get over the top of people and, and find angles because he's not necessarily moving people um, around the rim. So uh, I think it's just working and, and tailoring it to each guy individually. But um, there's things we do every day with post-progression. Nice. Okay. And uh, as far as other kind of stuff you guys run, so you, you're running, you have your, your, your main offense, high low. Is there anything else that's totally kind of out, outside this realm of high low offense? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in my time at, at Montana, um, we've done a lot of different things, right? Because our teams have changed. And so the unique thing was when we got here, we didn't recruit any of the players. Okay. So we, had, you know, even though the system was fairly similar, Wayne Tinkle played in the same system. Um, so, but we wanted to play a little different, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we had to win with um, guys that weren't our guys necessarily. And I mean, they're all of our guys, but they weren't the guys that we had handpicked to fit a system. Right. And so you have, you have to tailor it a little bit as a coach. Like I look at us, defensively when I first got here we played the pack right we played in so we were a little bit softer um we weren't as athletic um we weren't as quick so we would play the pack on defense um and then we ran um the a motion um which most commonly we'll see at Virginia right now it's like the Virginia motion where it's a flare screen baseline screen constantly so it's almost like mover blocker a little bit mm. um so that was something that we flirted with and some, some of the things that we have kind of in our back pocket, depending on our team and what we're trying to do with them that year. Um, and so then we've evolved now to where we're more aggressive on the defensive end in terms of being up into people and playing line of ball is what we call it. Um, and then I think playing a little bit more up tempo and a little bit quicker pace. Um, so I've kind of seen it in my time here at Montana doing a lot of different things. Um, but now that we've gotten our guys uh, and we are able to kind of recruit what we want every year, we don't really change what we do, to be honest with you. Um, it's pretty basic in, in terms of who we are, and what we, what we do every single year. Like if you watched us from three or four years ago, we're, we're pretty much the same team on the court X's and notes wise, because we have the luxury of being able to recruit the guys that we want. Right. Where, like at the high school level, you have to adjust constantly, you know, like where you may, you may not be able to run the same system year in and year out because you don't get to necessarily handpick the players that you get. Um, and so for us, that's one of the blessings of being at this level is we can pick what we get and we know some of the strengths of what we're, what we're getting. So, um, you know, I've seen it kind of all over the board a little bit from, from in the six years that I've been here, seven years I've been here. Okay. And then talking about recruiting, um, let's talk a little bit about that. So, Montana might be a challenging place to recruit to. Maybe not. I don't know. Just talk about your experience in recruiting there, maybe in versus when you're at Chico or just from what you've seen, you know, your strategies, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I've always done it the same way, right? Like I've always, I, I, and I think when I, when I talk about it, you know, and I say like, you got to work for good people or be about, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that's that been the theme of like what I would say is like I've worked for high character people, people that I think treat people the right way and run a program the right way. So that allows me as, a, as someone that 
Spearhead's recruiting to say, like, I, I'm very passionate that we can deliver a really good experience to, to the young men that we recruit. And so I think hopefully that carries over into like the, uh, the intensity, the authenticity of my voice to parents and the kids. Um, Montana, in all, in all honesty, is really easy to recruit to. Um, and I don't know how much you guys know about the program out here, um, but it, it is an incredible experience for the guys that are 18 to 22 years old, 23 years old. Um, it, you know, we're four or 5,000 people on a bad night in our, in our arena, um, you know, seven, 8,000 people, the tradition of winning. And, and this is where I think it makes it really easy because the things we sell are really the things we're looking for. Like we don't, we don't have like an identity crisis of what it is. Montana has been known to win since the nineties, the early nineties, um, going to NC2A tournaments. So naturally, uh, if you want to go to NC2A tournaments and compete for championships, this is a place that can do it. It's proven it can do it year in and year out. Um, so that part is easy to sell because we want winners. And I think if, you know, winners want to come, um, it, it's a place that has a tremendous passion for basketball. So like I tell the guys and what stinks about COVID is we have nine new players. And so I still get chills on like my sixth year last year here, when we do starting lineups and people stand in unison and they play the, the music and the, the, you know, the video screen or whatever they do. And they're calling out starters. I'm like, this is big time. Like this is a top 50 basketball atmosphere night in night out in college basketball. Like, I don't care where you go um, on the West coast. Like just talking to you guys, like Gonzaga's, you know, probably more, more impressive. Um, you know, I'm sure San Diego state is, I, we've never played there. I'm sure San Diego state is more impressive in terms of home court atmosphere and, and, uh, environment you know i know utah state would get it rocking there we've never played there i mean there, there's not many places that i can look at we've played everywhere in the pac-12 I mean, this blows that stuff out of the water arizona is big time um but like we just played at usc we've played at usc a few years ago oregon i mean this is an, an incredible environment to play basketball and if you love hoops if you love college hoops and you want to play in an environment so uh, it's pretty easy uh, and I think we have a good idea of this the type of student athlete we're looking for and what we need them to do day in and day out and, um, so I think when you have good vision of what you're looking for and what you want you can you can get it here nice I didn't know that that it was you know that many fans and the stands and all that kind of stuff so that's cool that's awesome it, it's incredible. And, and what's different, like when we were at Chico, we were trying to get Chico rolling, right? So it was a little bit different still. Um, but Chico sells itself too, in a way, right? Like just the people in the community. So it's very similar. I've recruited pretty much my entire career in very, very similar uh, environments where the community cares, right? You know this playing in the CC2A. Uh, you know, Chico, Humble might be the only two that really, really have atmosphere or environment, can, you know, on a consistent basis. Um, and so I've been fortunate that wherever we've been, it matters, you know, Chico, you're talking about, you know, getting a thousand people, but that's a lot at those, at some of those games and there's an environment mm -hmm. there. So, um, I've been lucky. I've been fortunate with that. It, cool. it seems like just kind of real quick, I know maybe it's a slight tangent here, but a lot of the places you've named, and I feel like I've noticed this across the board that a lot of the colleges that are in, you know, maybe mid to smaller town environments where they are the main show in town like the actual college environment and the basketball environment is actually really good it's like the opposite of what you would think because yeah. a lot of people i think they're like oh big city i'm gonna go there and all these fans but it's like well yeah but you go to la and there's you know 20 30 different colleges there and then you got pros teams and you've got you know just nightlife and other stuff people aren't going to come watch a, a game necessarily you know even if you're at ucla or usc um not yeah. that they don't get anyone, but like, it's not the same as packing out a gym, you know, it's just not that same feel. So I think there's a kind of a trend with that, where you look at you know, like a Humboldt or a Chico where that's the biggest show in town. And so everybody comes and watches because that is the, that is the pro team, you know, of that area. For sure. Trav, Trav always says it. They won the PAC 12 for like the first time in 50 years at Cal. And they were on page eight of like the sporting green, right? Um, Trav gets the job at Montana and his picture holding his daughter from the press conference is literally like the entire first page of the newspaper, right? So um, in a city of 100,000 people, when our guys walk across campus, they go downtown, they go to the mall, everybody knows who they are. You know, um, there's no face masks, right? Football is big here, but there's no face masks in basketball. So you're very recognizable and people know who you are when it comes to basketball. So 
and it matters to these guys, right? Like you remember that, I mean, we know this guys, like we played at small colleges and um, I think Menlo Alex like was special in the sense of the community and the rally, but we're playing in front of 50 people every night, which is fine. We made it big time where, where we were at and we really loved the program, but here it's like, it's just a whole nother beast. You know, like you'll, you'll show up and there'll be, there'll be a hundred people waiting outside and, hour and a half before the game to get into the arena. Um, so it, it, it's a fun atmosphere. Nice. Okay. Um, well, we're getting close to wrapping this up. So we're going to go ahead and ask one more question. Um, so what kind of advice would you have for younger coaches that are looking to become a college coach? Whew, be prepared to work, work for not that much money. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I say that half jokingly, right? I think, um, it, you know, it's the most rewarding thing. Uh, like we all know, right. Coaching is, is all about relationships and team building and, and being a part of something. Um, I think to get into the college level, you got to really have like the relationship. You got to have an, an avenue to really break in. Um, I think most guys that um, don't have a plain resume or a plain um, career that allows them to kind of slide into a spot where they can just make enough money. Um, you got to kind of be young, right? Like I, I look at some of our guys right now at Montana that are trying that played overseas that are coming back that are trying to start at 27, 28 years old. It's hard, right? Like you have a family, maybe um, you're expecting at 27, 28 to be making a little bit more money than what you're making right now. So the best thing that I did, I was 21 years old. I was coaching guys that were 22, 23 at San Francisco State, but I was 21 years old. So I could work as a waiter um, part time to make some money. Coach Tress would, you know, give me a hundred dollars, you know, here or there. Um, I didn't make any money from San Francisco State, you know, and I told you that when I was at Chico, um, I was making three, four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars a month to start off, and then I started making a salary after that. But I think initially you got to have a relationship, you got to have some connections, and you got to be willing to to work for not that much money, and, and to, you know, kind of be able to grind it. Um, and then I think you got to get in with good people that'll look out for you. You know, I was blessed uh, that when Kevin Nosick and Brandon Laird sat at my table to recruit me to Menlo, and I told them I wanted to coach. A big part of me saying I want to be with those guys and I want I want to play for them is that they said, hey, we'll help you get into we'll help you get into coaching. Um, and and so they did. They did that. Coach Laird wow. let me uh, start with an internship at, at Menlo. I was going to work for him until he left. Um, and so for me, it's like you got to get aligned with the right people. Right. I think there's a lot of people that think it's a glamorous deal or it's this or it's not. Right. It's 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 a hard uh, it's a hard thing. It's a grind a lot at the start uh, for the most part. Um, and, and so if you're going to spend that much time, you're going to have that much energy and effort to put into a program, you got to do it around great people um, and people that care about you and people that want to help you grow. Um, and I was fortunate with that, with, with Coach Tress, uh, with Coach Clink, with Gus Arginal, who are the three people that I think I looked up to and were really my mentors getting into this outside of Coach Laird and, and Coach Nosick. Um, you know, I was, they, they took me under their wing. You know, you got to have some people that show you the way. I, I'll never forget Coach Clink looking at me and saying, that is not how you do that. Like that's, you know, I, I used to get, you know, loose hair thinking about trying to get the projector set up to watch film the next morning, right? Like the littlest things, the littlest details. Um, and, and, but that was him making me better. You know, he prepared me to, to be able to do this. So, um, yeah, I think it's just getting with good people, finding the situation, being good where you're at, you know, like being good where you're at. There's nothing, uh, there's no uh, supplement for winning. And then people, you know, talking, the, you know, about your loyalty and your commitment to a program, um, you know, but I think just authentic relationships really is how I've gotten to where I've gotten and, and been fortunate in that regard, you know, that way. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. That was great. And a lot, a lot of those names you dropped, I recognize too. And um, I have a similar, I'm not going to go and tell this whole story right now, but a similar situation um, as a grad assistant where, you know, we, we showed up to Olive Garden, the reservations weren't solidified. And, you know, I remember him saying, hey, next time show up 20 minutes early, get him, get him set up. We're walking in and walking out. And I was like, all right, I'm new to there's this. Nothing worse, there's nothing worse, right? Like, <laughs> it, 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 it goes back to everything, right? Like, we, we have guys here right now, like, and I look at uh, the young guys that were our grad assistants and our, our video guy and our, our, uh, our ops guy that work for us. It's like, it's hard. You don't know. Uh, sorry, guys, am I, am I still on there? Yep, you're good. Sorry, you popped off. I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, I made my phone ring. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it, it's such a it teaches you a lot. Like you learn a lot about yourself. Like and I 
I think you learn a lot about like, how bad do you want to do this? Right? Like right. you're working for not that much money. Um, you're doing things that like, I remember this and I don't, I'm not throwing under the bus cause Rex would, would laugh at me. But like I was an assistant coach at Chico and I was interviewing for the ops job at USF and I met with Rex Walters and Rex and, and me and had a great relationship and we had talked a lot and knew each other pretty well. And he was like, well, he was interviewing me for the ops job and, and I was doing like, right guys. Like I was talking about like everything I was doing at Chico, the recruiting academics, travel, all these things. And he looked at me, he was like, well, you got to get player meals. Like that's a big part of it. Can you do that? I'm like, yeah, I can do that. You know, like it's, mm-hmm. but like that shows you how bad you want to do it. And like we have a young man that works for us right now as a grad assistant, a graduate manager that nothing is ever wrong. Like no job is ever uh, too small for him. Like if, if it's a meal, if it's a, a reservation, if it's putting film on a computer, it is done at an incredibly high level. So you, mm-hmm. you know that he really, really wants to do this. Um, and in turn, you're going to help him get a job somewhere and then you trust him to do the jobs that you give him. So we naturally give him way more things. But, um, those early, early days, like you're talking about setting up a reservation. Like, I mean, I would remember I would not sleep. I'd wake up at four o'clock in the morning because we would watch film after the Friday, Saturday games in the CC2A, oh, right? Yeah, We'd watch the game at like 8 AM, uh, from the night before. So we were always travel partners with Stanny. So like I'd have to get up and I would be in charge of saying, okay, when Clink walked in the office, the projector was going to be up on the wall with the game ready to go. And one time it wasn't. So I knew that from that point on, if it wasn't, I was in trouble. So, but it made me better, you know, like you kind of learn uh, all those things. And regardless, if I didn't get into coaching, if I didn't do it, it was going to make me better in sales or real estate or uh, whatever I was going to go do. It's just going to carry over. Right. So um, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Hey, so much good stuff on this episode. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you guys, have been checking out the episodes, then you know that we release a new video every single week. That's it. That's all we got for this week. And if you like today's episode and you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, make sure you subscribe as well. And thanks again, coach. Yeah, thank you. And if anybody uh, that's listening wants, you know, I know we talked a lot about offense. If, if you guys want some of our stuff, I can send you film uh, breakdowns of some of the packages that we run um, and some of the different series and counters like I talked about, like in that 20 series. If you want to see it broken down instead of just watching one of our games for an hour, um, I have no, I'm more than happy to send uh, drawings or, or film of, of what we do. Ah, oh, thank you so much for that. That's awesome. So. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and close out today's episode. We'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day. Peace. Peace.